Today is part two in the very short series, uh, Rediscovering Your Partner's Heart After Infidelity. And today I want to talk about how the betrayed can navigate the unfaithful and how does the betrayed rediscover the heart of the unfaithful. It's a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because by kind of nature or default, you might think, look, the whole journey is for the unfaithful to discover the betrayed's heart. But I will tell you, and Samantha will tell you, and thousands of other betrayed spouses who've gone through this before and who are on the other side will tell you that there is a part of the betrayed who really wants to rediscover what's going on within the heart and the mind of the unfaithful. That's part of recovery. It can never just be a one-sided process because if it is, the process actually breaks down and restoration really has an incredibly difficult time taking shape because it's always one-sided. So today, I want to give you some pointers and, and help you understand what we went through and what others go through and really kind of normalize the process for you because I find that when I hear other people's stories, when I'm going through what they've already gone through and they help me feel normal and they help me feel like I'm validated in my hurt or pain or even just utter confusion, it brings a sense of peace to me. And then when they can give me pointers, I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do a few of those things and see if they work. For starters, if there's one thing that I feel like the betrayed spouse experiences more than almost any other emotion is that the unfaithful won't talk, won't communicate, won't initiate conversations or heartfelt conversations. And they won't initiate these types of you know, discussions that Samantha and I had time and time again. And I'll tell you, before I go any further, it's absolutely normal and to be expected, and here's why. First off, the unfaithful has within their radar, they just don't want to piss you off again. They just don't want to make you angry because you've probably been angry enough or hurt enough or withdrawn enough and, and all that's to be expected. But a lot of times the unfaithful says, how can I just not make him or her angry or unhappy or set them off. I mean, I'm not tarring and feathering you betrayed. I'm just telling you the process is so rocky and emotional. It's normal for the unfaithful to simply say, I just don't want to cause any more pain because I'm the complete screw up that's caused all this pain in the first place. Second of all, the unfaithful, unless they've had really good help, doesn't really know what they feel or why they feel it or how much more to discuss it with you because they're walking on eggshells, they're afraid to be vulnerable, and then even more so, if there isn't some type of boundary in place, some type of objectivity in place, some type of safety in place, the unfaithful is afraid that they're going to say the wrong thing and you, the betrayed, are gonna judge them, shame them, torture them, throw it in their face, you know, hack away at them. So they would rather just stay very closed off, make it about your recovery, and not get very vulnerable with you. It can feel like, early on, as a betrayed, that the unfaithful is showing no leadership and no ownership. And I would tell you that that's also very normal because oftentimes, and I would say at least 70% of the time, the unfaithful is wallowing in self-pity, regret, anger, confusion, disillusionment. So to think that they are going to kind of rise up and take charge of recovery and get you to an intensive or take an online course or do some online work or, or you know, take the lead in terms of finding a therapist or all that, I, I know this is going to be a little bit tough to hear, but it's pretty normal is that's normal. It's just unrealistic to think that they're going to rise up into leadership. That does happen probably less than about 20% of the time, to be honest, because of the fact that they're so disillusioned by their choices. It's very normal for you, the betrayed, to feel like you're kind of leading the recovery efforts early on, that you're driving the healing bus, if you will. That's normal. Because they are so messed up, we are so messed up, so fragile, so confused, we don't know how to lead. We don't want to lead. We, we kind of want to wallow in our own self-hatred. 
but you typically have your head a little bit more on straight and you very typically will kind of look for counseling, look for help, uh, look for solutions because while you're hurting, you want to typically get better. The unfaithful, again, I say typically, we're so confused and so messed up, we don't know what to do. We're so full of condemnation that we're not even sure how to rise up out of the ashes. And so it is normal for you as a betrayed to kind of be the one setting appointments and finding a therapist and all of that. It is only after you get the right kind of expert help that you typically will see the unfaithful rise up and actually start to lead and take initiative and ownership of the recovery process. So rediscovering the unfaithful's heart takes some patience, but also takes some perspective to understand what's going on inside of them. And so as you are able to make the process safe for them to be vulnerable with you, you will see them start to open up eventually. As you find expert help that is objective, right? It, it's objective in the sense that there's not someone there that's going to attack them and tell them what a lunatic they are, but is actually going to create objectivity for both of you to share and emote without judgment. You'll see the unfaithful start to open up. And then as they don't feel judged and as they don't feel like what they're saying is ridiculous, they'll start to go, wait, he or she heard me out Wow, that's different than what they may be used to. You see, I was the same way, and there was a, a pretty significant moment with Rick one day where Rick was talking to Samantha, and we were kind of dealing with me, and it, it was what it was. I, I was used to it. And then Rick flipped the script, and he said, Samuel, so let's talk about you. If you were to name two top frustrations with what's gone on over the past few years of marriage, what would they be? And I looked at Rick and I was like, no way, brother, <laughs> that's not coming out. And he said, this is a safe place. I want you to be able to share. I don't want you to slam Samantha. I want you to just share from your own perspective some of the frustrations that you felt. So I did, very reticently and apprehensively and fearfully. And you know what? I said it, and Rick said, okay, and he looked at Samantha and said, you know, what do you feel? And she said, I get that. You know, it's tough to hear, but I think you're right, and I'm, I'm willing to work on that. It was monumental. Now, before you get upset, please understand, that does not mean that Samantha's struggles would in any way justify my affair or that, hey, Samantha, finally you're ready to own your stuff because I wouldn't have cheated if you'd have owned that a long time ago. Absolutely not. Please don't believe that. Please don't run with that. That's not true. However, in the recovery process, there has to be objectivity and there has to be safety. When those things are in place, granted, coming from two willing parties to participate, it will absolutely help you both rediscover each other's heart and find a mode of connection that eventually, months and years down the road, will be absolutely life-changing and a wellspring of joy and oneness between you two.